if you've ever asked the government to fix something, then you're actually making it worse and you're probably part of the problem. Um, because time and time again, they demonstrate that they just, to try and fix it, they'll make it worse. They'll steal our liberties, they'll tax us, and we'll just hate the solution. The intrusion into our freedoms is actually kind of gradually tearing down what makes Aussie so, so cool and fun. I love Australia, so much that's good about it, but I am very, very concerned and getting more concerned as time goes by about where Australia is going, uh, and particularly the amount of rules that are being introduced and the amount of restrictions that are being introduced. And this wasn't something that concerned me when I was younger. But once you open up your mind and expand your range of ideas, it's probably going to change you, which it did for me. The worst uh, genocides in history have been perpetrated by governments and uh, would never have happened in the absence of a big powerful government. With where we are right now, we have massive amounts of government control over most areas of our lives. We have enormous amounts of government control over what we can and can't do economically, who is allowed to employ us and under what terms we're allowed to get a job, uh, what fields we're allowed to get jobs in, what we can and can't do with our own private property, whether it's our, our house or our car or, or land that we have or our boat. We have enormous government control at being exercised over relationships and, and over speech, over children's education, how you raise your own children. How bad are we going to let it get before we, and, and when I say we, I mean a significant majority of Australians, actually shake off our political apathy and demand a, a change in direction? The Sydney lockouts were introduced in a response to a couple of violent incidents in which some people died. The assumption being that um, if they stop people from going to King's Cross late at night, then it will save people's lives. What it's done, of course, is stop people from going to King's Cross, but it's basically killed off the cross as a late night venue. A lot of business has gone broke. Uh, a lot of people lost their job. And, and we now have violent hotspots uh, popping up around the city. So my name is Lorraine Finlay and I'm a law lecturer at Murdoch University and I specialise in constitutional law, criminal law and a bit of human rights. The difficulty I have with the lockout laws is I think they've probably come from good intentions but end up, first of all, not really achieving what they meant to achieve and having a really enormous flow-on effect and you know, one of the difficulties with laws like that is you're really dealing with the lowest common denominator. You know, you're starting to assume that everybody's doing the wrong thing or that everybody's going to be creating trouble rather than looking at it from a perspective of the vast majority of people do the right thing and should be left to get on with what they want to do. Well, I remember when Keep Sydney Open first did street rallies and there were you know, 10,000 10, people minimum walking on the street and going to Hyde Park to protest against this and for years they just ignored it. We have to stand up for our principles. You should have the right to run your business and be open as late as you want to, as long as you're interfering with anyone else.
By trying to either set people's life purposes or trying to direct them through social engineering, uh, it, it tends to have very bad outcomes. So um, if it's lifestyle choices, it leads to a suggestion that the decision maker has object, a, a notion of objective morals or objective morality that needs to be achieved and overlooking the fact that morals are not objective and that morals are being challenged and tested and ch changing over time. And um, when it comes to the economic sphere, it becomes even perhaps worse because when you challenge people's morals, they, they, they get their hackles up and they may resist it. But when you begin to try to direct the economy, well, what do I know about economics? And uh, you know, these people are more better trained than I am, more intelligent than I am. So you often will give in to, to these suggestions that when they're beginning to ma manipulate or try to stimulate the economy. So this is, um, this is where it may become uh, more problematic. So they get away with more in that sense. I'm Christopher Lingle. I'm a semi-retired professor of economics. I grew up as a mainstream uh, neoclassical Chicago school positivist economist. And then I began to live in the real world. <clears throat> I bumped into public choice economics, then I ran into Hayek, and then I learned economics from Mises. So I don't claim to be anything other than a voluntarist and um, an individualist, so uh, I try to avoid labels. Well, economics is one aspect of human action, uh, meaning that it's the aspect of life where we engage in trade. So this is what the essence of economics is. It's uh, about finding ways to cooperate with other human beings to make their lives better in order to make our own lives better. And I think that's probably the simplest way. Uh, underpinning that is the, the acceptance of the, the idea that people are living uh, purposive lives. They're trying to achieve some life purpose. Of course, the life purpose is constantly changing. It's being interpreted in new and different ways based upon subjective value. And so we can actually see uh, what's happening in terms of people's own happiness and people's own uh, self-realization and self-actualization based on the, the level of freedom that they have to use their money how they see fit. If people are using money how they see fit and there's no kind of other external factors pushing them one way or pushing them another way, then what we actually have is, is people at the happiest place that they can be according to their idea of happiness. I might look at you and go, you're an idiot. You're spending your money on all the wrong things. But the beauty of it is, I just have to go, you know what? You know what's best for you. I would, even if I would never make those decisions for myself. And I'm gonna to continue to make my decisions for myself and for my family that I believe are actually the best way that we use money. G'day, I'm Gideon Rosner. I'm Director of Policy at the Institute of Public Affairs, Australia's oldest and largest uh, free market think tank. People who work hard should be able to keep the fruits of their labour. People who want to start a business should be able to do it with minimum interference. People who want to hire people or people who want to take a job should be able to do so with that minimum interference. The danger, of course, is that politicians need to do things to justify their own existence a lot of the time. A lot of the time there are uh, lobby groups and vested interests who come to politicians in Canberra and say, well, we, there's a, a potential safety issue with X, Y and Z industry, and we really think you should int introduce a regime uh, that will, will, will ensure safety in, in the sector. Will, will ensure safety in, in the sector. The, 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 there was a little parallel side story to that, is my mum got diagnosed with lung cancer. Um, five years ago and that gave this a really big push because that made me look at the tobacco industry in a very different light. When cancer comes into your house it changes a lot of things. We fall under the um, tobacco license so I have to cover up, tint, not display any products. Products can't be seen from outside or inside um, and obviously we have the, the nicotine issue. All these added up make it very difficult for someone, not only for a business to survive, but for your average person to quit. 
um, to use this as a quitting mechanism like we all did. We've had people come in from, from Big Tobacco, from Philip Morris, from, you know, wanting us to put tobacco products, wanting us to, and, and it's a big NO from us. It's a really, it's a, it's a stance we take with a ton of other vape shops and other vape operators in this country. Um, our objective is different. How can I sell a tobacco product that's killing someone um, next to, uh, uh, you know, a product that is, is helping people get away from that? Vaping is legal in Australia, but if you want to vape with nicotine, which is what the vast majority of vapors do, because nicotine is the chemical that they're addicted to in cigarettes, it's illegal to possess that in every single state and territory. Uh, and the implication of that means that vape shops can't sell it. You can visit a GP and get a prescription for nicotine and order it online. You order it from New Zealand, Europe, from the US, and China, anywhere but Australia. Pretty much every country where they've got nicotine vaping legalised, uh, their smoking rates continue to decline, whereas here in Australia, ours are flatlined for the last few years. You don't need to go into a lab and wear a hazmat suit with, you know, goggles and, oh my God, I'm handling a poisonous substance, Jesus. If you put a puddle of nicotine in your hand, it's going to take a very long time before anything happens. A very long time. It's available in a ton of vegetables. Um, its effect on the human body is the same as uh, caffeine. One of the issues that health bodies in Australia seem to always parrot is that it could provide a gateway and attract kids to take up cigarettes or take up vaping who otherwise might not have done it. But all the research shows it's about a quarter of a percent of people that do that. Just anecdotally, I know I feel infinitely better every day than where, where I was even just two years ago. I don't cough every morning when I wake up. The thousands of other chemicals inside of a cigarette is what is killing you. It's not vapor. Bingo. It's like standing over a kettle and <laughs> expecting, <laughs> expecting it's got something carcinogenic. That. That's yeah. the fundamental point of it. It's not doing damage to your lungs in the same way. Yeah. When a customer walks in, we can't say anything. By law, we can't advise anything. How do we pass on the knowledge? We have to wait for questions to come out of the customer. Australian small businesses get absolutely creamed by the over-regulations that we have on, on vaping here, to the point that they treat it worse than tobacconists. Me opening this display to you guys, if we had the health department walk in right now, th this is a problem. Um, this is definitely a, a problem and they'd walk in and yeah, oof, hands up, <laughs> you've displayed your bottles. Quit Victoria has an online portal which has a hundred different ways to quit and it's like different suggestions on what you should do if you're having cravings for cigarettes. Some of their suggestions are like, if you want a cigarette, have a shower instead. Listen to a song. Like, our taxes are paying for this bullshit that doesn't work. Smoking rates still sit pretty much the same as they were four or five years ago. Uh, smoking consumption went up in 2017, and we're throwing millions and millions of other people's money at this when we have another alternative, a market-based alternative, that we know will work. All these, you know, covering up tinted windows and, you know, us thinking of ways of how to show, showcase our products to sell them, um, really put pressure on a small business. How do I make my business grow? And the only question I find is that, let's move to NZ, right? Stop paying taxes in Australia, stop employing people in Australia, just move my business, my brand, over to NZ where I can freely sell nicotine and help people. Um, and, and reach the objective that we've always wanted to reach is help as many people quit cigarettes as we can along this journey. Now we at the RPA have estimated that the cumulative effect of unnecessary regulation and red tape cost the Australian economy $176 billion 
each and every year. That's $176 billion of businesses that have never been started. $176 billion of people who, have ne who haven't been employed, of better living standards, of cheaper commercial goods, of better lives for us all. And, and, and the worst part is that it's not something that gets a lot of attention in the political debate. Um, it, is a, it is a silent issue. It is a sleeper issue. It's the old analogy of the frog in the pot. If you drop a frog into a boiling pot of water, it'll jump straight out. But red tape is the water turn, the, the temperature of the water turned up slowly. So all of a sudden you wake up one day and any business you want to in, in open or invest in, any activity you want to do, even as Bob Catter will tell you uh, famously, boiling the billy will require a permit. And that's unfortunately the state that we find ourselves in Australia and much of the West in today. Goodness, the political spectrum of left and right. Well, I'm going to be I'm going to be a cantankerous so and so and say I don't actually think there is a left and right in the normal uh, in the sense that it's certainly portrayed in political textbooks and these sorts of things. Uh, to me, there's a spectrum, and, and if we if we want to orient it to the left and right, it's more of a vertical kind of spectrum where there's there's more freedom and more choice to the individual, uh, and then there's less freedom and more power to the government of whatever form that might be. And and what you'll tend to find. The so-called left will tend to be um, all about freedom when it comes to certain social type of issues, who you have sex with, who you can marry, um, when it comes to drugs and these sorts of things, they'll tend to be very pro-freedom on those issues and very anti-freedom on a lot of economic issues. No, you can't keep the money that you've earned. We are going to take 50% of it off you and, oh, you've earned a billion dollars, we're going to take 80% of it off you. Uh, on, on matters of, of speech and ideas, they tend to be very restrictive and they want the government to be able to control what you're allowed to say and, and these sorts of issues. The right, broadly speaking, are kind of the inverse, although these days it's getting really, really muddy. And so they will tend to want the government to dictate what plants you can smoke, you know, or they'll want the government to dictate your relationships and your private life and these sorts of things. But economically, they're all about, no, 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 you go you, you earn that money, you keep that, etc. And so we have this false idea that these are the opposing ends of the spectrum. Actually, they both believe in far too much government power. They just disagree about how the government should use it. That's the argument that they're having. The argument that I would make is why are we giving the government power in any of those areas to begin with? So, you know, you have to say, well, what, what do either side of politics stand for? You know, what are their values? And the only thing you can say is they both want to be in government. Uh, there's not much, you know, what reason should they be in government? Well, we'll spend your money better than the other guys. That's, that's about all it amounts to. So, you know, every time we sort of say to the government, you know, you need to fix this, it's like, well, no, you, you actually probably need to take responsibility for yourself. And there's not enough of that. There's, we, we have this crutch that we lean on that's the government. And in all reality, it should be literally, you know, look, look after yourself. You're, you're, you're a responsible human being. Um, take responsibility. Don't expect someone else to, to, to pick up the slack. Uh, we need to move towards a more principled understanding of the world that doesn't simply look at left and right, but looks at what the right answer is and what principles can get us there. And I believe that libertarian principles are step one to getting there. My name's Chris Berg. I'm a senior research fellow at the RMIT Blockchain Innovation Hub, and I've been involved in the freedom movement for uh, nearly two decades now. Libertarianism isn't this foreign ideology that comes in from, say, the United States or the United Kingdom. There is genuine Antipodean liberal and libertarian heritage, and it's important for Australian libertarians and, and the broader Australian community to recognize that storied past. It's basically a belief in small government, the, the idea that people do things for themselves better than governments can do it for them. I think most libertarians don't identify as libertarian. They don't realize it. If you were to actually ask them, do you think you should be free to live your life, you know, without being interfered upon for doing stuff to yourself? Most people would generally begin with, yeah, sure. You know, they, they might have some caveats about some things, but generally speaking, most people, I think, are sympathetic broadly to libertarian ideas. I'm Avins O'Brien. Uh, I live in Los Angeles. I am a Second generation libertarian, I come from a, a, a family of libertarian activists. I talk to a lot of feminists, and feminists tend to be on the left. There's a whole group of us that are libertarian feminists, but 
but there's a lot of like lefty feminists and I love to talk to them about consent culture because consent culture is this big thing about anti-harassment, anti-rape, anti like this whole bodily autonomy thing and that's wonderful. And then I like to talk about the fact that libertarianism is consent culture applied to everything. So if you don't have the right to touch me without my permission, why do you have the right to take a portion of my income without my permission? What we do with our bodies, what, like the labor, the work that we involve ourselves in, like that's that's also that's part of us. That's part of our you know our individual sovereignty. And so when you tax that, and when you regulate that, when you control that, you reduce the options for that person. Most people wouldn't mind paying a bit of tax voluntarily. Some people will be willing to pay even more than what the government charges them. All libertarianism says is, let it be the choice of the individual. And I think it takes a pretty big cynic to argue that the only way you can have a society where people are willing to give up a bit of what they have for other people around them is if you put a gun to their head. That simply isn't how human nature works. Life in a civilized society has several sensible components. One of them is you keep your promises, you fulfill contracts. You don't engage in violence against your neighbors. And the third one is not engaging in fraud, which is really, all of these come down to the same. I mean, these are all woven together in a sense, if, if we think about it. The non-aggression principle is basically don't fuck with people and don't steal their things. We've developed these conceptions based on the human experience, based on empathy and obligation. So we put ourselves in the shoes of another person, do unto others as they would do unto you. There's a version of that in every tradition. It's not a Christian idea, it's a universal idea. Why is this idea universal? Because it's from the human experience. And I think it's really important to articulate it as not just, you can't tell me what to do, but I can't tell you what to do because you are an important person and, like, and, and you're an important person to you and your values and your life and your preferences. That's the starting point, I think, from where the rights flow from. Because if you're willing to say, I don't want someone interfering with my property, or taking away my stuff without any just cause, you will then apply that same lens to someone who's richer than you and say, well, unless they're convicted of theft or fraud, why are we able to steal their property? I find it strange that anyone can't like it. <laughs> um, pe people sort of on Twitter or something might have these bloody libertarians, you know, they just want to do all these things. I'm going, well, we actually want, you know, what's saying we want to take over the world and leave you alone. But the most important thing is when you're talking about rights and freedoms to realise that they're not inevitable. You know, there isn't this natural progress that will happen in Australia. If we all sit back and just think that, oh, well, we live in a pretty free country, you really wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Um, well, your rights and freedoms won't survive in that type of circumstance. You actually do need to be not a conspiracy theorist and not seeing people taking your rights and freedoms away at every turn. You know, we live in a fantastic country, but it's not perfect. And um, there are, there's always the need to, to reflect on whether things could be better in areas where, in fact, they're being infringed. If you think about where your rights come from, do they come from the government or do are they inherent? Do they come... Uh, just by right of the fact that you're a person, or you might be a religious person and you might say, well, they come from God, but they don't come from the government. If you think that your rights exist because they're written in a Bill of Rights, well, then they're rights that a government has effectively given you, and by that same token, their rights can be taken away from you. If you believe that human rights stem from the fact that you're a human being and therefore you have this inalienable entitlement to these fundamental rights, well, they don't depend on a piece of paper then, they depend on the fact that you exist as a human being. So it's something much more intangible and that means there's something that can't just be taken away at the whim of a government, it's something much more powerful than that. So our task in a way is to compress the size of the government, get it down to the point where we think it's doing the things that only governments can do and re by retrieving our rights from the governments that over the years have, have taken them over. And I don't, I'm not a student of political science, to be honest, so uh, I, I came to being a libertarian sort of only in the last uh, probably 10 years, I suppose. Uh, I lived in the US for a year, and that was, it was really weird, lived in California, worked for Google, you know, somewhat left place, you might say. And um, I found myself being shocked quite often about what people were allowed to do. <laughs> it's a weird thing, right? Have, have it. Well, they're letting them do that. What's going on? 
And then I came back to Australia and I got pissed off that there, were, that there was regulation to stop me from doing things, if you know what I mean. So I sort of had that bit of a turnaround. But we had a, a long journey into, uh, into, into being a, a family. And at one stage we looked at adoption. Um, and you know, the fact you've got to apply to a government public servant who are going to assess your fitness to be a parent, I found to be the most disturbing concept ever. That's how it works. I was told point blank that given my BMI, I wouldn't be clear for adoption. I thought, right, that's all for the kid. And I get that. I actually think child welfare is enormously, you know, uh, is something we should concentrate a lot on. But I'm like, right, so every person wishing to be a parent should have to go through the same process then. Oh, no, you can't do that. You know, if we ever, you know, we, we can't, I'm sure they'd love to, to be quite honest. But you, you imagine that. We could be as unhealthy and unfit and un- inappropriate as we can, and we have a right to have a child. But all of a sudden, a public servant gets involved. But literally, they have all these little top points. We says, I, we, I, will you be a fit parent to adopt? I'm like, it's actually disgusting. Public servants meddling in private affairs. I just, it's still just, uh, yeah. I, I actually find it, yeah. It's, it's one reason just to, to terminate the government out. Once you encounter the incompetence, it, it's really quite shocking and it kind of wakes you up a little bit. And for me, that was the, the water crisis and the way that water was being mismanaged during the drought that we had, so the so-called millennium drought that we had here in, in Southeast Australia. That was what really woke me up. Before then, I was actually broadly pro-government. I, I was broadly someone who thought that the government was there to do good and that we should all obey the government because whatever rules they've made are for our own good. I was one of those people. And it wasn't until I actually had a subject that I began to get a little bit passionate about and I began to look into and realize just the, the, the multiple layers of incompetence over incompetence that were underpinning the decisions the government was making that I began to go, well, hang on, maybe all isn't the way I thought it was. And that's usually what it takes for most people. It's a specific issue, and it's gonna be a different issue for every single person, but a specific issue encountering the family courts. That's a big one for for a lot of men in particular. Uh, Encountering the the, the drug war and the the prohibition on drugs is a big one for a lot of people where they realize just how insane something is. And that starts them down that rabbit hole of maybe questioning some of the other areas that they haven't questioned before. But it always starts with a particular issue. The war on drugs has been going on for some time and so far the drugs are winning. Uh, Not only are the drugs winning, but the uh, criminal enterprises profiting off the drugs are winning too. And when you look at a non-war on drugs solution, what you see is the opposite of what the war on drugs people expect to see. In places like the Netherlands and Portugal, far fewer people die due to these drugs. We have all these people who go to prison and instead of being able to become productive members of society, and it kind of ruins anyone's chances of being a productive member of society in the future because you have a criminal conviction and then it's very difficult to get jobs and to get housing and everything else. So I've actually got a sister who died of an overdose. The, 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 the model that treats these people like animals means that they go off and they do these things in areas where they haven't got support networks or they haven't got help, and they are gonna die. So. No one agrees, I I don't think anyone's saying these things are good. By and large, I'm happy to put hard drugs into the bad for you category. I'm happy to say, you know what? This stuff is gonna mess you up. It's gonna mess you up, it's gonna hurt your family, it's potentially gonna kill you earlier, whether it's overdose or whether it's just fatigue on the body from being abused by this stuff. This is really bad stuff. What I disagree with is making the leap from, therefore, the government should force you not to do it. That's one of these things does not follow the other. Many people just assume if it's bad, the government should do something. If it's good, the government should do something. Whatever it is, the government should always be involved in every area of your life, prodding you to do the good things and punishing you for doing the bad things. And that's just how it ought to be. There's a couple of things really seriously wrong with that. Firstly, what you have then are people making decisions, bureaucrats and politicians making decisions that don't actually affect them. And this is bad because the further you remove the consequence of a decision from where the decision is being made, the less the decision maker cares. 
And if it achieves this little good that they aimed to achieve, it doesn't matter how much bad goes along with it because they're not bearing it. And that's really the best way to understand the war on drugs. They can usually point to some sort of a stat that suggests that the drug war is working, that they've, they've captured this many drugs, this many tons of drugs trying to come into Australia. Therefore, look at all the good we're doing, all right? And they say, see this good? This is worth it. What they're ignoring are the massive negative consequences of what they're doing. Negative consequences including not just the fact that they're spending enormous amounts of taxpayers' money. I mean, when, when we talk about the war on drugs, it is a war budget. The amount of money they're spending to try and find this stuff as it comes over the border, to try and, and clamp down on people who are growing or, or purifying drugs in Australia, it is, a, it is a war level budget and that is being funded by the Australian taxpayer. So that's number one. Number two, organised crime loves prohibition. They wouldn't exist without prohibition. It's no coincidence that, that organized crime in the US absolutely took off when the alcohol prohibition was, was brought in. It's, that's not a coincidence. That's a direct consequence. Organized criminals need things that people want that are illegal. And if you think about it from an economic point of view, what a government does whenever they shut down an illegal importer of drugs, they're actually protecting the business of the ones they didn't catch. They're actually propping up the floor price of the product for the ones they didn't catch. They're actually an important part of the economics of, of the illegal drug trade. They are the ones that are making the business model viable. If you want to see that in, in, in practical evidence, look at what's happened with the illegal tobacco trade in Australia as we've kept on pushing the taxes higher and higher and higher. Every time the excise goes up, the profit margin for the illegal imports goes up. If one out of every two shipments gets caught, they're still way ahead because our excise, the tax we pay on tobacco, is multiple times the actual cost of the same tonnage of tobacco on the world market. It's no surprise that we're seeing a real jump in violent crime and robberies where the, the criminals are actually just targeting the back wall of the shop that's full of cigarettes. You know, no longer are they going for the, for the cash in the till. Who cares? Give me the cigarettes because I can sell those for a fortune because the price has been so artificially inflated by excise. And so it's these kinds of negative consequences that usually get ignored by the regulators. They focus on that little tiny positive bit of good, which often I don't disagree with. Is it a good thing when fewer people take hard drugs? In my opinion, yes. I think they're very destructive. But I think there are so many massive negative consequences of the way we're tackling the problem right now that in my opinion, it actually outweighs the, the small amount of benefit. Not to mention the fact that we have an enormous number of people still taking these drugs, despite all of the money being spent, despite the, the, the so-called war. It's insane to think that the government launched a war on a plant, if we talk about marijuana. It's insane to think that the government launched a war on marijuana, a plant that has never killed anyone, all right? They have an almost unlimited budget. They can spend as much as they want, and somehow they're losing, right? They're losing to a plant that has no budget and has never killed anyone. The essence of the economic problem, actually the essence of life, I believe, and the reason we engage in human action, the reason we do things and make decisions, is this thing that we call scarcity. Now, scarcity means that there's always going to be conflict over what is going to be used, how you use it, and who gets to use it, and what is the outcome of the use of it. Once you understand that you have these conflicts, you can either resolve these conflicts through violence or through peaceful cooperation. So what happens is that the market provides a way to solve that problem. Uh, Marx saw private property as the problem, and the solution for him was to was, you know, reduce or eliminate private property, and we would have some utopian outcomes eventually. Adam Smith saw private property as the solution. And I think he was right uh, that uh, once we have private property, then we can establish terms of exchange prices and uh, find a way for us to cooperate, to solve our mutual interests in fulfilling our life purposes. We have lost, we have lost I'm sorry, a lot of, of emotionally speaking, many things, families, friends, uh, memories, places, so it's like you are feeling that your own country is no longer existing. I mean, quoting the, the when I was uh, watching Avengers, you know, when Thanos decides, that I'm, I'm spoiling you, Infinity War, I'm sorry, but uh, that you feel that uh, it's everything like turning into ashes. Well, 
in, to a certain degree, degree, what is happening in Venezuela is that your country, your memories, your, your ground is lost. It's becoming ashes. What you knew in the past is no longer there. So it's very hard to say that you are Venezuelan, but the memories of what you were, of, of your past, of your roots, are no longer there. Uh, and that is something that is even, it doesn't matter of, of, of your origin. I mean, you can be poor, you can be rich, you can be white, you can be black, you can be male, you can be female. Everything, everyone has, has lost, lost something in Venezuela right now because of all this process. So that's the reason why I, I said that uh, uh, socialism is uh, more destructive than a nuclear weapon. I feel like everyone just wants an angry grandpa that yells about things, and I feel like that's kind of what Bernie Sanders is. is Bernie Sanders is kind of like your angry grandfather that's like, wow, well, everything should be different. We call everything that's government socialism. That's been a thing we've done for like decades. And the problem with that is when we call everything socialism and those things are perceived as good, like, hey, this thing helps poor people, or hey, food stamps help, you know, like they're socialism, or uh, public schools are socialism, or anything like that, then we're teaching those people that socialism gets them those things. Like, that's what we've done. We've, we've said, great, that's socialism. You don't want that. And they're like, yeah, I do. Uh, my name is Andres Guevara. I am a citizen of Venezuela. I was born in Caracas in 1984. Uh, since then, well, I'm here because I, I am part of, I am a member of Cedice Libertad, that is the Center for the Disclosure of Economic Freedom in Venezuela. It's a local think tank based in Caracas. Well, what's, what's happened in Venezuela? Uh, well, have you seen Jumanji? But I will say that uh, perhaps the, the nutshell of the problem, the core thing that we must take into consideration is the fact that uh, socialism arrived, central planning it's in its whole uh, enforcement, and the consequences are there. So when you try to plan human action in every aspect of your life, you suffer this kind of consequence. This is no, there is no accident in what is happening in Venezuela. There is no kind of conspiracy against the country. People are looking at these things wrong, and they're not able to articulate the difference between socialism and capitalism. You know, they think capitalism is just a bunch of rich people owning everything and, and poor people not having anything. And, you know, when you say capitalism is simply like private ownership of capital, <laughs> that means that's not private ownership like Walmart ownership of capital. That means your ownership of capital, my ownership of capital, these people putting their capital together and starting a company. And we can look at this in, in the, there's an age-old analogy using two islands. And let's say we have two completely separate islands, each with two people, each with a hundred bucks. One is going to be run on cold, heartless capitalism. All right. It's going to be all about the dollar, all about the profit. The other is going to be run as a compassionate socialist island where everything gets shared. Okay. On this island, the capitalist island, these two people know if I don't do something, I'm screwed. I have to get off my lazy butt and actually do something. So one of them heads out to find food and find water, and the other one starts building a shelter. All right, that's the capitalist island. On the socialist island, one of them heads out to find food because he wants food, all right, and to find water because he knows how important that is. And the other one goes, oh good, I'm gonna get fed soon, and sits on the beach. Doesn't do anything else. At the end of the day, on the capitalist island, the guy comes back with food and water, and the other guy pays him and says, I'd like some of that food and some of that water. Sure, pay me money. I'm a greedy capitalist, I want money for my work, all right? And the guy with the shelter says, hey, you can sleep in here, but you're gonna have to pay me for it. And the guy looks up and goes, yeah, I don't wanna get rained on. Sure, I'll pay you some money, all right? Greedy capitalism at work. They both sleep in shelter with full bellies. The compassionate socialist island, the guy comes back with food, shares it, they both have full bellies, but they both sleep out in the elements on the, on the beach because the other guy had no motivation and no reason to actually get anything done. They both had the same amount of money on the island but the capitalist island is now, has now increased in value because there's some infrastructure there that wasn't there before. It's not the money, it's what was given in exchange for the money that actually increased the value. Well, in reality, it looks like Venezuela versus Colombia. All right, we've got Venezuela right now heading down the socialist rabbit hole. They did what that island, what the socialist island did. They said, we're gonna redistribute everything. We're gonna make sure that everywhere, we're gonna be a compassionate country under Chavez, all right? And he ran all these social programs and the people loved him at first. But then all of a sudden, they started running out of food and they had to import food. People believe that because of oil was there and uh, redistribution of wealth was enough, 
uh, Venezuelans were able to live under a standard of living that will remain forever. And then suddenly we, we woke up and we realized, we understand that wealth has to be created, institutions are important, and democracy and government has to be limited. Many people say, well, but if the socialism in Venezuela wasn't well applied, that's not socialism. That was exactly the same thing that we said 20 years ago. It's the same argument that people say in our country, in my country. The tragedy that's going on in, in Venezuela is entirely driven by bad public policy choices. The government has nationalized private industry. The government has controlled and manipulated the money supply. The government has expanded the role of the state into every area of the economy. It is a perfect, although tragic, example of how socialist policy can destroy an otherwise thriving country. Well, if socialism comes to Australia, I mean, you are going to run out of koalas and kangaroos because you're going to eat them. I mean, this is not a joke. Uh, uh, we are an oil producer country and we no longer have gasoline. So never one in, in, in Venezuela thought in the past that we will have to spend like between 12 and 40 and 24 hours in line to fill our tanks of gas. So there is a saying that says that be aware of what you are looking for and wishing for because it can come to reality. Socialism, of course, is very emotional and we understand that, yes, there are things that are unjust, that things are like a, seeking for more justice and more equality because I, I really understand them. In fact, I mean, I come from a country with a lot of disparities because, I mean, I come from Venezuela. It's not like I come from a, a place where uh, everyone is like uh, taking baths of gold and, you know, on the contrary, I come from a very poor country and I and myself, I have seen um, how is inequality working and how bad is to be poor. I mean, believe me. But what I have seen is that uh, because of central planning and because uh, the movement that tries to get the state planning of everything, things tend to get worse from a practical stand, uh, standpoint. What's happening at the moment is that there's a, there's a pretense that inequalities of wealth and income are, number one, destabilizing in terms of political continuity and that they could possibly lead to a decrease in economic growth. Both of these are wrong, both in terms of history and in theory. In fact, there's no theory behind either of those. So if, if we put that off the table, then the seductive promises of progressives or social democrats or socialists that are trying to take power, uh, you take away some of the allure of their argument. So it's not only about seeking justice, because I really believe that justice is important and equality is important. And I mean, the people that are oppressed also must be uh, not oppressed and they must be like uh, able to find their own freedom. But there are means to obtain that, that not necessarily are socialist means not necessarily conduct to a planning enacted or enforced by the state. I think that we should prefer market organization to government organization because the consequences of market failure are much less than government failure. There's a system in a market that allows us to learn, allows us to adjust, allows us to make choices that affect us. Governments, however, are big and bureaucratic and when they make mistakes, it affects everyone in society. Markets and governments both have problems. Markets are a much better solution to almost all the problems that we face. Resist all these siren songs for expanding political power and go after those arguments that are insisting that political power is a solution to those problems. I think what we find now is that social democracy is solutions looking for problems. And uh, those, you know, so they say, oh, climate change, give us more power, we'll fix it. Uh, income inequality, give us more power and we'll fix it. So we, we have to realize that this is the game.
uh, and because representative democracy has degra become degraded to the point where it's a redistributive game. So we need to rediscover the, the, why we need democracy. We need democracy to promote and protect human liberty and personal dignity. To get through the maze of regulation makes it so hard for young entrepreneurs these days. And I, yeah, I, I think young people should get strongly behind the ideas of small government and less regulation. I'm surprised when I hear them talking about oh, we've got to regulate more because it will, you know, it's going to tear those guys down. But it's, well, it's actually not. It's actually going to um, fortify them because regulation is a protection, ends up being a protection for incumbents. It probably comes alongside my general rant about MBN, for example, right? We're talking MBN is the, the largest piece of horrible sovereign interference I've ever seen. Um, but we, you know, we as in we the community, asked for, bade for it, you know, literally. To, to, to reinstitute a goddamn monopoly, for Christ's sakes. And, and the reason we have MBN is we forgot about Telecom Australia and how bad that actually was. I, I call it regulatory battered spouse syndrome, which is exceptionally politically incorrect, but who gives the toss, right? Because it, it is actually a term in that, you know, we, get, we cop a flogging from the, from, the, from the monopoly, right? We break them up and, we go, we, and, and seven years later, we go crying back to monopoly. They give us a backhander and, and treat us like shit again. So <laughs> we've actually asked for it. So we have to start taking responsibility for ourselves. So I, I say I advocate for deregulation of property development and expose myself to more competition. You know, that's the risk, but I think it's the right thing for the prosperity of, of the country and also for the opportunities of young people. Like the more that, that your kind of people can start businesses because there aren't regulations in the way of, you know, so that someone in the middle class can start a business, someone who's poor can start a business. When there are more businesses, there are more jobs. When there are more jobs, there are, there are more options for labor and that benefits everyone. And so is the answer more regulation? You know, if, you know, if, well, this is the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. We need to try something different. And, that should be less regulation. Historically, if you, if you actually have a look at the history of Western democracies, there is more regulation and more legislation being written all the time at a far faster rate than any is being removed. In fact, in many Western democracies, there's basically no legislation being removed. In a few, there are some rules around uh, sunsetting old legislation, but for the, by and large, we're just writing new rules all the time and never actually getting rid of the old ones. What that means is we now have a, a legal system that is, and a regulatory system that is miles high of paper. The perverse thing about that is ignorance of the law is no excuse. So, oh, you didn't know what it said on page 158,000 of this particular code? Oh, well, that's no excuse. You were still bound because it's the law. You're still bound to obey it. You're still bound to follow it. And there's something really perverse about a system that says ignorance is no excuse, but we're going to write so many laws that it's impossible for you to know them all. And I think to me, what should the role of government be? Well, let's start with government should have no more rules than it's possible for one person to know. Let's get there and then debate the next step. One of the legitimate goals for a government is the protection of property rights and self-defense. Um, this can exist in conjunction with the minimal state, which doesn't then also try telling us, oh, by the way, you have to pay more taxes on sugar because we have a national obesity policy and you can't be fat. You think about what the purpose of a government is, right? When you think about ideally what the purpose of a government is, and the government should be there to uh, ideally prevent us from hurting each other and, uh, and to maybe, maybe uh, arbitrate disagreements between people regarding their contracts. So if you and I have a contract and it's a, um, and, and there's an argument about like the terms of that contract, you know, that we go to a court and the court can say, oh, well, you didn't pay them, blah, blah, blah. And, but then there's the issue of a social safety net. And there's an issue of how do you deal with the poor and the vulnerable. I think that libertarianism of all of the political creeds is the one that actually has the most faith in your fellow man. It's the one that actually elevates the other person to the status of adult and says, hey, you know what? I have faith in you. I think you can make good decisions for yourself. And if you make some dumb decisions and you fall flat on your face, I'm your friend and I'm gonna be here, here to help pick you back up again. And I'm gonna to wanna to hear you 
tell me that you've learned your lesson, you're not gonna be that stupid again, all right? Because I'm gonna be alongside you as your friend to help you get better outcomes in your life. The other way to do it is to say, I'm the bureaucrat and I'm gonna control your life and I'm gonna tell you how you can and can't live. And if you're stupid and you make a mistake and you fall flat on your face, I'll stick you into a welfare system that doesn't actually really care about you. You're just in a program and I don't know your individual circumstances and I don't really care if you ever get off welfare and find your feet again. I've just created this system and this program and I've plugged you into it. Of course, we need a safety net to protect the most vulnerable in society, but too often welfare dependency is uh, a trap that is keeping too many people out of the workforce. So they may have a base level of where they can subsist, you know, and have a dole payment that covers food and some basics, but if they want to try and make a step outside of that, they lose a whole bunch of benefits and they go, well, trying to get out of this cycle has too many risks, so I'd rather stay within the safety net that exists. If you take a low-level job that pays you, I don't know, $35,000, $40,000 a year, or a part-time job paying you $25,000 a year, it's actually gonna mean that you start losing some of these other benefits, which means in the end, you might only be $10,000 better off, but now you're having to work, all right? And if you just didn't work, then you'd, you'd still be where you are now. And it actually creates a trap that keeps people inside welfare, because if you don't take that you know, $25,000 a year job, you're never gonna have the skills required for the $50,000 a year job for the $75,000. That's the first rung on that ladder. And now people are actually being disincentivized to take that first rung and get themselves out of poverty. There's a reason we see multi-generational poverty and multi-generational welfare dependency. It's because the welfare system itself is a trap. And once you're in it, it is very, very difficult to get back out. Is there a libertarian answer to how to take care of the most vulnerable in society? I believe in the most voluntary society possible, so I would like to see as much of that covered by charitable works as possible. I, I like to live what I say, so I say private charity beats public charity. It, you know, private action beats government action. It's always more efficient, it's always more direct, it always gets to the source of the problem. But I'm not gonna say that and then say, oh, well, you go do it. I'm personally involved in working with homeless people here in the Southeast. And it's heartbreaking, it's a tragedy, but it's generally a very, very complicated cause. There's usually a complicated multi-layered cause. And these are people who the government are actually not really helping anyway. There are people already falling through the cracks of the government system and it's the private system, it's private charity in direct action that's actually picking these people up and stopping them from quite literally dying on a street corner. The government's not stopping people from dying on a street corner. They're helping people who are not yet at the bottom to kind of stay where they are. We're not giving these billions of dollars to the poor. We're giving them to people who get to decide where they go and they don't do it well. They're helping people who are not yet at the bottom to kind of stay where they are. Really, why, why would you want the government getting involved? The government is a big impersonal beast, very inefficient. If, if something is capable of being messed up, the government will mess it up quicker than anything else. Ideas are the most valuable thing that we have. All of our technology, all of our lifestyle stems from someone having an idea and then usually communicating that idea with other people and then ultimately that leading to a technology, to a change in social structure, to a change in the way we organize ourselves, to some kind of a change that is built up over centuries and now thousands of years uh, to what we know today. And pretty much everything that we have today started as an idea. And if we can't talk about ideas, then we have just squandered so much value and so much potential future value. Freedom of speech is one of the fundamental liberal and libertarian values. And without freedom of speech, we can't have the free society that I think we all strive for. But it's not just one right among many. It is the most important and fundamental right because it goes to who we are as human beings, our thoughts, our beliefs, our conscience, our ability to express ourselves. We cannot have the sort of public conversation that we need to come up with new ideas, to navigate challenging political questions if the state is threatening us or trying to prevent us from being able to speak our mind. Because people don't get challenged by ideas anymore. People aren't exposed to a diversity of ideas and people therefore find it really hard to identify whether ideas are good ideas or bad ideas because they're not exposed to any different opinions. So the easiest way I think that you learn to differentiate between 
truth and falsities by experiencing both and by actually having ideas being contested so that you can judge them on their merits. Any good libertarian will tell you that you should be able to do whatever you want so long as it doesn't impede on the rights of others. The thing with free speech is it's very easy to be in favour of it when you like what the person's saying. But the test of free speech is whether you support people being able to say things that you disagree with or that you find objectionable or that you just flat out think are wrong. Let's say for example I meet a racist person who yells a bunch of slurs at me. My recourse isn't to complain to the police officer or the teacher or mommy. Because I understand that if I complain that his mere words are a crime, then suddenly what if the government doesn't like my words tomorrow? People say we want the government to do something, we want a law to ban it, rather than thinking about, well, what can we do as a community to show that this perhaps isn't speech that we would support or be in favour of. Laws don't last for a year or two, they last forever. When Obama was the president, he used a lot of executive power. Um, and his supporters, the Democrats, all thought, well, what's the problem? And then when uh, Trump became the president, Trump started using the same executive power. And all of a sudden the Democrats said, hang on a minute, you can't do that. And then they were reminded, yes, but Obama did it. Now, if you had listened to those of us on the small government side, and we said, uh, the president should not have that amount of power should not have that amount of authority. It's dangerous to have that amount of authority. If you'd listened to us at that time, perhaps we might have done something about it. But now you can't complain when the shoe is on the other foot. That's what, that's what free speech laws are like. In terms of 18C, I've written in the past that I first of all think 18C is a morally bad law, um, but more importantly, I think it's a constitutionally bad law. But that's probably a topic um, for another day. Why is it morally bad? Well, I think it's morally bad because when you start defining hate speech in such a broad way that it's not actually about speech that leads to violence, it's about speech that leads to injured feelings, effectively. Um, when you start restricting things that people can say on that basis, you actually have a whole... Um, chilling effect and unintended consequences that I think are really damaging. Can you shut the door when you go out, please? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> shut the door, please. Thank you. <laughs> I'm kind of uncomfortable talking to you about it. I feel like it's a tension. It's, it's a point at which people get triggered, and I know that. Uh, but I need to get it out. I need to talk about it. I need to figure it through. So about 12 years ago, I made an artwork. I did a portrait of myself and my family in blackface. I made that as um, a response to people saying to me, oh, well, you're not really Aboriginal. And so I thought I'll turn myself and my family into this stereotype that people want to see. Andrew Bolt saw the work. So even before the show opened, he saw this blackface work that I had made. At the time, he was writing quite um, extensively about uh, white opportunistic Aboriginal people or fair-skinned opportunistic Aboriginal people and he, then he saw this portrait of me and my family with blackface called Not Really Aboriginal and he began to write about it that day. I got a call from an Aboriginal legal firm initially asking me if I wanted to take him to court and I agreed because I thought I was going to have an opportunity to just defend my character. As I went through the process of beginning to take him to court, which ultimately took two years from beginning to ending up in federal court and then the case being announced, 
I still didn't realize that I was entering into a battle for free speech. Well, at the time that I entered in the, into the court case against Andrew Bolt and the Herald Sun, I didn't understand how important uh, free speech was and remains. And so I hadn't looked into ideas ab around Western civilization, around democracy, uh, capitalism. Uh, I hadn't looked into the, the amazing legacy that the Judeo-Christian history has given us of absolute freedoms. And so I, I didn't really understand. But as I went through this Christian conversion, which uh, was the impetus for a political conversion, I began to read and read and read and read and read. And as I read, I began to have revelation that uh, I was on the wrong side. I was fighting for the wrong things. Well, in the case of freedom of speech, they should be looking at getting rid of laws that pose a barrier to freedom of speech. So the simplest way to fix 18C is to repeal it. I can't remember a specific or a defining moment where it just was like kaboom, that was a mistake. It was kind of a slow unfolding revelation and it it almost began to burn on my heart, this sense of regret at what I'd done. I really wanted to apologise for taking him to court under the Racial Discrimination Act. I explained to him that I was sorry that I'd used that law, I didn't think he was a racist and I deeply regretted it. It was really nerve wracking because you've got to imagine when I made that portrait, the blackface portrait, and I began to fight against Andrew Bolt, I was a social justice warrior queen. I was lauded on the left. I think the day after I went on to his show, I was pulled out of an exhibition. Uh, and the artistic opportunities have all but dried up. So it's kind of more like a silent uh, assassination <laughs> rather than a public one. It's really stretched us. Uh, brought us closer together, um, you know, tested our faith and also knowing that we have to do the right thing, stand up and speak about this, was the highest priority. I would say that I'm a soft libertarian. I really, really uh, am invested in the idea of free speech, uh, free markets, personal responsibility, especially because I've come out of that victimhood identity into this sense of personal responsibility. Uh, I know that that's where freedom is. It's so important for anyone to have freedom of speech, freedom of expression, particularly as an artist. I mean, I'm making a, a work that spells out welfare as slavery. People are not going to like that. It's going to trigger them. But it's meant to be pointy. It's meant to poke into things because it's making me uncomfortable and it's going to make you uncomfortable. This notion of forgiveness, of looking at people with grace and mercy, not because they deserve it, but because I deserve it. Like I'm a bigot and I want people to allow me to make mistakes and say stupid things and do stupid things. And I want to give other people the grace to do that. That's what I love about Christianity and that was probably the biggest revelation for me in bringing me out of a victimhood identity was that there's no victim identity in Christianity. You're forced to confront all the ways in which you've done wrong in your life and to take responsibility for it and to reconcile with people like Andrew Bolt because I see that he's just a person doing things, making mistakes. I was too. Um, you know, we can cross that divide, come together and see each other in a different way. What we see with this whole censorship of speech is the state almost wanting to become a religion. 
and wanting to say, you will behave in these certain ways. And if you do, you are a virtuous person. And if you do not, we will punish you because you're not a virtuous person. And we will be the arbiters of what's acceptable, what can be said, what can't be said. And they're essentially elevating themselves. Forget the separation of church and state. The state is becoming a church as it starts to enforce these, these rules on what we're allowed to think and what we're allowed to say. Some ideas throughout history have been completely offensive at the time and yet have turned out to be true. And an example that I think is, is really important for more people to know than they currently do is uh, the issue of Semmelweis. And he was a doctor in, uh, in Europe and he began to notice a correlation between the washing of hands and birth mortality of both the infant and in particular the mother. The most dangerous place for a woman to be in that, at that time was in a hospital giving birth. The, the, the mortality rate for women who were rich enough to be in hospitals was far worse than for the poor women who couldn't afford a doctor. They didn't understand germs at the time and so he came up with this harebrained theory that forcing the doctors to wash their hands in between cutting up a cadaver and a dead person and delivering a baby was going to save lives. It was completely offensive and a complete affront to the established medical knowledge of the day. It ran counter to everything that they thought they knew. He was abused. He was treated horrifically through his time. He managed to actually get into a position in one hospital where he was able to enforce hand washing and the fatalities just dropped dramatically. So even despite having the results and having the evidence that this actually works in his hospital, he was still marginalized, rejected, despised. He became so passionate because he knew this was life or death. He's watching the fatality rates of these other hospitals and every single one of those statistics represents a human being whose life has ended and it didn't have to happen. He got so fired up, he began writing letters that are borderline abusive. He, he got so anxious about literally trying to save lives and the fact that no one was listening to him, uh, that eventually they actually committed him to an insane asylum. They said, you've lost your mind. You, you're completely insane. And he died in that ins in insane asylum. He got beaten by the guards and ironically died of an infection that got into the injuries from, from when the guards uh, beat him. So here's this guy who had one of the greatest medical breakthroughs possible, a, a life-saving, world-changing observation. He didn't yet know the mechanism by which it worked, but he knew that it worked. And he died as a madman in an insane asylum because he had rejected and, and everything that he was saying was an affront to the established knowledge of the day. It was only a few years later that germs were actually discovered and they suddenly went, oh, there's germs all over dead bodies. And if we stick them inside a pregnant woman as we're, as we're helping her to give birth, then we're gonna kill her. And they suddenly understood. And it was not that long afterwards that his procedure of hand washing with a particular solution uh, to kill all the germs was actually normalized across all of Europe, but he died as a complete outsider, a reject. Uh, and what he had to say was completely offensive and unscientific, and this is the key. He was rejected as unscientific, as someone who you know nothing. All of the medical literature says that you're wrong. And yet, he was literally saving lives. Uh, the idea that black people in 1950s and 60s America were equal to white people was deeply offensive to white people. But it was a very important conversation that needed to be had. The idea that the apartheid system in South Africa needed to end was deeply offensive to the Afrikaans. But it was a conversation that needed to be had and it was a change that needed to happen. We have to be able to have offensive conversations. This is crucial to our ongoing development. We are where we are because of the ideas that we have and the, the way that we're able to communicate them. If we stifle that communication just because we're trying to protect a few people's feelings, then we are literally going to be stifling our ability to continue to progress. You will have more evil where you have incentives to be evil. In the case of the government, there are many incentives to be evil. Uh, the governments need to constantly get elected all the time. That doesn't incentivize them to do what's best for society, it incentivizes them to do what gets them votes. More importantly, it's usually what gets them votes in the seats they need to win. Woodrow Wilson once said that we need to make the world safe for democracy. I think we need to make democracy safe for the world. Democracy, representative democracy, represents one of the greatest dangers to human liberty that we have today in the sense that people are naively embracing it. Um, Representative democracy has become a game to redistribute wealth and income. Every legislative act today 
is a creation of subsidies and privileges which violate this fundamental idea of the rule of law, which is the absence of privilege. The rule of law was a reaction to the rule of monarchies being, being able to have arbitrary control over one's life and one's incomes. And we fought revolutions, we chopped the heads off of kings uh, in order to implement this rule of law. And that was meant to be our lodestone, that was our guiding uh, concept. Absence of privileges, that, that the rich treated the same as the poor, the strong the same as the weak. But in fact, what's happened in representative democracy is that what well, we're deciding that we should apply um, privileges to people. We're going to give students subsidy. Well, that's a privilege. That was never meant to be. Taxation was meant, not meant to be a redistributive tool. It was meant to be a, a way to provide collective consumption goods, or what economists call public goods. I was raised in America in the immediate post-war era, in the 1950s in the United States, where we had good reason to believe that the American government did good things, and that we did the right things, that, um, you know, that we helped bring not democracy, but liberty to, to places that had been taken over by colonialism. So World War II was a war against imperialism, and that, if there's such a thing as a just war, that may well be. I'm not sure that the United States had to be involved, but we were. And it got, in any case, there were good results. So it was easy to say, well, but that was democracy. That's what we thought. And so with that, we went to sleep, we went on autopilot, and let representative democracy to become degraded into this redistributive game. And alas, that's where we are today. So we have to have this rediscovery of the importance of the rule of law, I believe. And uh, I think that's where the debate needs to be, to, to, to point out to people that, no, look, subsidies are privileges. And if, if, you know, there's a lot of debate in the United States about white privilege. Well, it's not just white privilege, it's privilege granted through a legislative process. That's what's dangerous. Uh, there's no white privilege that's upheld by legislative procedures. I mean, th this is a, an imaginary concept uh, in the sense that, and it's not really as dangerous in the sense that, uh, what, what's, what's dangerous is political power. Uh, political power developed through this issuance of privileges through legislative diktat. This is what's dangerous and this is what we need to teach people. Because at the end of the day, if we keep assigning more and more power to these people, what happens when one day a really awful person gets access to the levers of control? A really awful person gets access to the levers of control. Any outlaw regime that has ties to terrorist groups and seeks or possesses weapons of mass destruction is a grave danger to the civilized world and will be confronted. We've begun the search for hidden chemical and biological weapons and already know of hundreds of sites that will be investigated. When the Iraq War was being discussed and even being launched, I was sympathetic to the aims of bringing freedom to um, a country that has lacked freedom for so long. I think, however, the experience of um, US intervention and Australian intervention in Iraq has been a really telling lesson about the limits of state power. You cannot bring democracy by the force of a gun. I don't think that the people who you are bringing democracy to would be particularly excited about that. Libertarian foreign policy is one of non-intervention. So we don't interfere in the um, sovereign affairs of another state because ultimately it's not the job of one country to pool its own people's resources together to fight the battles of another country. As a philosophy, libertarianism is supposed to be opposing war. And there's a number of reasons for that. When you look at what a war is, right, it's, a, you know, it's, it's, it's government fighting theoretically against another government. And 
And we know that people aren't their governments. We know that you know the American people, like a, a, a percentage of them, voted for Donald Trump, but not all of them. By by going to war, you're effectively saying these people, but we're, they're going to be collateral damage. They're going to be killed for a mistake, they're, for something that their leaders did. And I find that to be tremendously collectivist. And as libertarianism is an individualist philosophy, I find that, that that to be a problem in and of itself, not to mention the inherent violence of war. And the government is the institution that has a monopoly on force. Uh, and they use that force regardless of whether the non-aggression principle is violated or not. The current things that are going on in the world are so terrible in, in many ways and we can look at like horrible things happening around the world and, and I know that a lot of people look at those things and we have to stop that. But we've seen what happens when we do and you know we have, gen we have generations of knowledge of what happens when we go in and we say we're going to fight these guys over these guys and, and we're going to support this or try to install a, 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 a democracy here except it doesn't end up being that and it's, it's making decisions for other people and none of it's good and it doesn't have good outcomes and we've seen this over and over again. Well, you know, one of the ways to try to explain to people the fallacy of the idea that war can be good for an economy uh, is to use Friedrich Bastiat's uh, broken window fallacy, which brings it down to a, um, a more human level in the sense that the idea was that, well, if you wanted to make a, a community better off, then break all the windows and all the homes and then this will create jobs for the, uh, the window manufacturer and the pe people that, um, that uh, replace the windows. But in fact, what you've done is you've destroyed wealth. I mean, the destruction of wealth cannot be the basis of improving the, 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 the standing or the welfare of a community. Now, the tragedy is that very intelligent and, and very, very well-educated uh, people promote this myth. A, a fairly recent example of this is that Paul Krugman, after the 9-11 destruction, of, this massive destruction of wealth, never mind the destruction of human lives, uh, he said, well, this will probably be good for the New York uh, economy. I mean, this, this is a monstrous argument because it, it, it distracts people. It's kind of like, well, you know, wars are kind of bad, but you know, look at what we get from them. What, what you get from them is slavery through conscription. You got wealth destruction through, you know, destroying cities and, and the, the diversion of, of, of scarce resources into armaments that are blown up. And I mean, this is monstrous. Keynesian economics, in a sense though, is an, in, it's an institutionalized logic that supports this monstrous uh, idea about war in particular, because, you know, the idea that Keynes would, you could uh, bury 10 pound notes and then pay people to, to dig them up is, is the, the same logic. But as I say, that, that logic supports this monstrous decision that 
destroying people's lives, destroying capital, is actually good for an economy. And the idea of using Western middle class people's taxes to fund these wars, which overwhelmingly benefit really rich military contractors, is an absolute farce. The libertarian perspective on foreign policy is as much about trade and migration and these, these key global integration approaches. So non-interventionism is an approach to the extension of military power. I don't think we should be trying to invade countries. I don't think we should be trying to bring democracy to the force of the gun, but we should be absolutely engaged in the world. We should be trading with people. We should be um, sharing migration with other countries. That's a really key part of the libertarian view. Governments can be evil, but they, they can also be well-meaning, well-intended, but they are inherent, inherently untrustworthy. You, you really can't say that the, the government is always going to be a force for good. And quite often they're not. The worst genocides in history have been perpetrated by governments and uh, would never have happened in the absence of a big, powerful government. It's interesting, if you look back at the history of the United States and the political history of the United States in the 19th century, there were two really dominant issues that were either in the foreground or the background. And one of them was, must we have a central bank? We don't have a central bank now, we have a Federal Reserve System, which was a clever way of using or distracting people from what they were trying to impose. So I think if they'd call it a central bank, it would have been much harder for them to smuggle it in. The other one was, should we have a standing army? Uh, and the idea was that no, because one of the grievances against the king and what that motivated the revolution, American Revolution, was that you know the, the presence of this standing army threatened the preservation of human liberty. And um, so until World War I, the answer was always no, we don't need a standing army. Uh, now we have both a central bank called by a different name and a standing army. Now one is necessary to support the other. Uh, the central banks, if you look at their history, were invented as a way of promoting the, the interests of the monarchy. The bank of Sweden was one of the, the first, then eventually the Bank of England. So. Why did they support the monarchy? Well, monarchies uh, had uh, either imperialism on their mind, an evil, or wars, another evil. So central banks have always done that. And now, unfortunately, the United States, uh, the, the central bank is the primary uh, aspect of the capacity of the United States to have wars all over, imperialist wars all over the world. The artificially low interest rates are what allows the U.S. government to run massive deficits in order to finance these imperialistic wars of aggression and wherever these are. So if you want to get rid of these wars of aggression, <laughs> the way to start would be to get rid of the central bank. just look at how to fix the problem and fixing the problem does require some some thoughtful ideas I mean, any number of things uh, going back to private banking that is deregulating uh, private banks and allowing private banks to issue competing currencies or or competing corporations I mean, Apple uh, being concerned with its uh, reputation could 
issue a currency and it would be much more cautious about preserving the, the value of, it, of a currency as a way of protecting its brand and reputation than governments are. I mean, if, if Apple or a bank uh, issued a, a, a depreciating currency, they would be punished for it. When governments issue a uh, depreciating currency, they seem to be rewarded for it by certain interest groups. And um, so private banking would be one way, a restoration of a commodity standard through, say, gold standard. Uh, the problem is we don't have a monetary system any longer. We have a global system of debt issuance. The paper currencies uh, are not money, they're debt. And there's no redemption. There's no, there's only expansion. There's a, a, with, with a commodity standard, you could always redeem money for gold. Gold was money, money was gold. And now you redeem paper currency for more paper currency. There's no redemption. So that means there's no constraints. So we have an infinitely elastic supply of paper currency. With a commodity standard, you have a finite capacity to expand the money supply. The, the price of money uh, needs some sort of anchor, a, a standard, uh, or a restraint on its perpetual expansion. One of my areas of scholarly research is the history of banking in Australia, and we had a thriving monetary system with free banking, so banks would provide currency themselves until 1911. That system actually worked really, really well until the government took over the money supply. We don't need a central bank. It's very clear from the economic and historical evidence that a central bank is unnecessary. Now that we have a central bank, we should exercise monetary power and monetary discretion very carefully. I think we should have a rules-based order. But having said that, I think the clear lesson from history and the lesson from the economics of banking is that we don't need the state to be involved in such a central part of the economy, the money supply. How bad are we gonna let it get? before we, and, and when I say we, I mean a significant majority of Australians, actually shake off our political apathy and demand a, a change in direction. The reason I think it's gonna get a lot worse before that happens is a couple of things. Firstly, when you look at the levels of welfare dependency and the fact that more than half of Australian households have government income of some sort being paid into them, uh, that a very large minority of Australian households would not be able to meet their bills at the end of next month if it were not for that government money coming in. Any politician that comes along and says, hey, you know what, for the good of the country, for, for to actually secure our future, we need to spend less, and that's going to mean cutting back on some of these welfare programs, they're doomed. Doomed to be a, a political uh, sideshow at best. And for as long as that's the case, we're going to continue voting for more and more welfare, more and more spending, more and more deficits, more and more debt. I think we're headed for harder times globally over the next couple of years, and we have no way to respond to it. Interest rates are already extremely low. Growth is already low. Wage growth is stagnant. We are not in a position to respond uh, individually or collectively if you want to talk about what the Reserve Bank can and can't do, and that's a whole other story. We've, put our, we've painted ourselves into a corner, and as things get harder, people are going to demand more. I, I, things are hard for me, I need more government money. I'm going to sign up for more programs that I didn't previously bother signing up for. I'm going to vote for the politician that tells me they're going to increase my payments. And then you have a, a very rapid downward spiral. And I, I think we've gone past the tipping point where that spiral can be avoided. I think there are too many people, too many voters dependent on those handouts to change that direction. So my outlook is a little bit bleak, I'm afraid. I, I don't hold a lot of hope for the medium term future. But let me let me paint a longer term picture. Our future is largely going to be dominated by progress in technology and progress in ideas. And for as long as mankind can continue to communicate, continue to come up with better ideas, continue to rediscover old ideas that worked but were abandoned for whatever reason, then there continues to be hope. And couple that with rapidly improving technology our quality of life is likely to remain good, as good or better than it's ever been as time goes on. Our level of freedom is much more of an open question.
well, this is the definition of insanity, is doing the same thing over and over again and expect a different result. We need to try something different. So we put ourselves in the shoes of another person. Do, do unto others as they would do unto you. You can't tell me what to do, but I can't tell you what to do because you are an important person. Compress the size of the government, get it down to the point where we think it's doing the things that only governments can do, and re by retrieving our rights from the governments that over the years have, have taken them over. So we need to rediscover the, the, why we need democracy. We need democracy to promote and protect human liberty and personal dignity. So if you're an every, ordinary, everyday worker, taxpayer, um, going about your business, it's more likely that the government's trying to catch you doing something, right? Catch you out. Um, and it's, it's just a pretty, pretty sad situation, I reckon. So, well, perhaps it's better to get involved, to be an advocate of, of what you believe. Don't let indifference uh, grab you. My friends on the left are not fond of the government, so right now they hate Donald Trump, so it's a lot easier in, to just say, do you really want Donald Trump to have 30% of your income? It's, it's a lot easier to do that. So right, so you want to actually keep more money out of the productive part of the economy by taxing people higher to get ready for a recession. Shouldn't your job to be to avoid the recession? And the way you avoid that is to make sure the productive economy is working really well by not taxing them so much. So libertarianism then is not this idea that selfishness or greed is a virtue. I mean, some libertarians might argue that philosophically, right? Um, but it's the idea that voluntarism, leaving it up to free association, free choice, and most humans will do the right thing. And where they don't, then we can have a discussion about how we can mitigate that. Franklin oh, Delano Roosevelt made the ownership of gold criminal. Now, this was never taught in schools as something that was an abomination. Ownership of gold is not dangerous. I mean, people don't need to be put in prison or to be dispossessed of their wealth for owning gold. And in fact, Americans were not legally allowed to, to, to have gold as in bullion form until the 1970s. I think this is just shocking that, that this was not a subject of, of open debate. Do you want individuals to be more free? Do you want them to have more individual rights, more individual liberty, more freedom to make their own decisions? Or do you want, to want the state to do that? The answer turns out is not left or right. It's not conservative or progressive. It's not leftist or rightist. It's libertarian or statist. And I'm a libertarian.